yesterday, <clears throat> how did we get here? And this one is about, um, there was no such thing as slavery, as we have been told. That's a lie. And so I'm going to go over the American history to give you an idea of what I'm talking about because we all know the history book said that all these people were shipped over here by the millions from Africa <clears throat> and held as slaves in bondage and put into servitude. Well, you have to pay attention to what they are doing now because they can only repeat things cyclic because we are in a, a cycle. Everything has to be done in a cycle. I'm going to do a couple more invites here and then we're going to get down to the nitty gritty on what really goes on. Okay, so and <clears throat> so in the whole system that we are in, we are what you call under the law. Under the law. What law? <clears throat> we are under the law of Levi. Now, when you go to the biblical book, now this is the blueprint for the society or the social structure we live in, the New Testament. Now, at the age of Aquarius, when um, the son of righteousness comes, which is now, and he's coming to free the people from the law. What law? We know Old Testament that the in the book of Leviticus, um, the Israelites was given like 613 laws to follow. <clears throat> what they don't tell you is they also set up a judicial system. And they don't never pay that any attention, nor do they point your attention to it. Because this is the modern day judicial system. It's Judean. That's why it's Judah at the beginning of it. It's Judean. All right. So we're talking um, um, Zionists who work for Yahweh, who is who you call Enlil in the Sumerian tablets. And now America was what you call a free land before the voyage of Columbus. Now, Cristo... Colombo was his name. Cristo Colombo. Now, this is going to tell you a secret, right? Now, they got to give you the opportunity to discover it. Where have you heard the name Colombo? Colombo. Well, you have this guy named Peter Falk. What do, what, Peter, father, Falk, Falcon. Peter the Falcon, you got to pay this attention, is playing Colombo. All right. Now remember, they switched from matriarchal to patriarchal. So Peter, or Father Falcon, the father. So now they're giving you a secret in pop culture, and they're tying it to a historical reference. That's a um, that's a, a key. So Judea is the one sitting as judges, right? And the judges are adjudicating. Now notice you got the word Judah in there. It's adjudicating. The judges adjudicating um, what you call the rights, R-I-T-E-S, the rights of Levi in the Levitical system. Now how do you know it's a, Le a Levitical system? Because they tell you in your United States Code that all law is commercial. And if all law is commercial, that means it's to be, commercial is where you barter, trade, buy, and sell. That's commercial. That's not industrial where you produce and distribute. Commercial absorbs industrial. So, um, if all of the law is commercial, that means the law is bartered and traded. But what do they mean by this? All right? So, they're telling you black people was a slave for a reason. To keep you trapped under the law. Now, here is the trap. 
the system of barter and trade, or I should say the system of stocks and trade, is under something called uh, the law of levies and lien. There is the word Levi in the first word, levy. Levy is Levi. So now they're telling you you're under the laws of Levi. So when, you're, when you go to church and your preacher tells you that you're supposed to be under grace and not the law, how do you get from under the law to under grace? It worked like this. In your U.S. Constitution, no native was supposed to be taxed. And this is in the first article of the United States Constitution. It said all natives non-taxed. It's the reason. And then it said all others tax three-fifths. Now, when they said that, it wasn't a clear distinction who they was talking about until what we call the Dred Scott ruling. Now, the Dred Scott ruling uh, delved into the three-fifth compromise aspect of the Constitution. And be the judges ruled that because Dred Scott was only a three-fifths human, I mean, he's only three-fifths realized. So that means that they're telling Dredd, your gold and your silver cord are not active. Because they're not active, I can tax you, the rest of you. The physical form, what they call the dust of the earth, is taxable. It's property. It's a um, lot. It's a lot. L-O-T. That's land. It's a lot. So it's taxable. But two-fifths... You can't tax a god. Uh, according to the ancient code of kings. Now a lot of people don't know about the ancient code of kings. Because a lot of it has been removed. Because then you would know that who the imposter was. So the ancient code of kings says that you cannot tax a god. But the aspect that's unrealized is not the god aspect. So if the god aspect is an unrealized aspect of the self. You are called three-fifths compromise because the two-fifths is not realized yet. So now, in the Dred Scott ruling, it says that the black man has no right that a white man is bound to respect. Now, why would they say that in a, in a court? Now, first of all, this ruling of Dred Scott stands to this day because it's never been repealed or overturned. So, why would they tell you that? A black man has no right that a white man is bound to respect. Here's where it comes from. As long as you don't know what you are, you cannot assert your God-given right of sovereignty. So when you see the Moors, they're going through all of the judicial system. And they're showing you that you're in the law, according to the law, you are incompetent and you're dead. You are a corpus, a corpse, a body. So when they need to re retrieve you, they have to use something called the writ of habeas corpus, which means bring the body before me so that I can review it right now. The writ is called the great writ because it's supposed to be the most powerful um, tool in law. Now, as long as you three-fifth compromise and you not five-fifth realize, you are a subject. Now, here is where it works. In the law, it say all natives nine tax. The natives was recognized already as being five fifth realized, so they can't tax them because the claim of right, R I G H T, first claim of right, that means that you have the first claim to this piece of property, goes to the two fifths. Once the two fifths is realized, the silver body and the gold body. Once the once they realized then you no longer three-fifth compromise, you five-fifth realize you're not in a system no more because there can only be one judge over you, and that's the Christ. There can be no other judge over you when you five-fifth realize except the Christ because the Christ is the judge of us all. So, in America, what you are looking at is uh, the great melding pot. Listen to the terms that they use to refer to the land of the free, in the home of the brave. Who was the free? When they came over here, this was what you call an open and free society. So you hear JFK talk about secrecy being repugnant in a free and open society. Um, so this is what he's talking about. 
because all of the secrecy and the deception <clears throat> comes in when the victors write a history that will make you more compliant with his domination and subjugation of those he won the victory over. So let's look at our history that they tell us is our history. They tell us that Christopher Columbus discovered America, but it was people here. They said that America was named after Amerigo Vespucci, who came much later than Christopher Columbus. So what was they calling it between Columbus' voyage and Amerigo Vespucci? Okay, now, they tell us that the conquistadors conquered Central and South America. They tell us, okay, the conquistadors are the Spaniards. So now you got this all-out march on what they call the Western world. Now, everybody's been looking for the New World Order, but it's been here ever since George Washington took power. We have been under the New World Order. And I'm going to prove it to you by the terminologies used in reference to this country in one minute. And so the judicial system, the, the Jewish system, the Levitical laws were warned about by the founding fathers. Now, here's what, where the deception begins to take flight. Continental Congress. They told us that the Continental Congress was the leaders of the colonies scrambling to form a nation in opposition to England. That's a crock. That's a crock. That's not true. The truth of the matter is the Continental Congress was a treaty negotiation. And that's why the treaty is the first thing that must be recognized in the Constitution. The treaty overrides all the other laws of the land because they have to be resolved first because this is a conflict of nations. So in the Continental Congress, now know it's saying continental, that means this land mass. And then they're saying the Congress. The, con the Congress that they're setting up is the Congress or the representatives of the 13 colonies at this time. Now notice, 13 colonies. They're telling you something with that. Now how many tribes of Israel was it? 12. But you never take to realize that Israel himself make number 13. So pay attention how you get under the Levitical laws and you'll understand how you was never a slave. This was a military campaign. The tools using right now that's disintegrating before our very eyes of divide and conquer that was written as a military code called the White Supremacy Doctrine where it used the skin-based caste system of India that was learned by the military conquest of the Indus Valley by Alexander. The Greeks having great reverence, as if you read the writings of the philosophers, you would know, having great reverence and respect for the African that they call them the Aethiops um, or Egyptos. And they had great reverence for them for bringing them the wisdom or the Sophia, the Ain Soph, the divine wisdom that allowed them the right to ascend. Now, when the patriarchs went on the rape campaign to subjugate the women, and they wanted to deceive everybody into... Um, into a, a condition where we would never openly discuss this and none of us that learns it would be willing to come out and openly tell it. Well, the inmates running the asylum now and we about to take it over because I'm going to tell y'all how it went so you can look at the timeline and you can see how they twisted it out of your view. Now, the Continental Congress is a treaty negotiation between the 13 colonies who were all POWs from England. Now they tell you in England they dumped out their prisons. They emptied out their brothels and all of those that were seeking religious freedom was allowed to come to the land of the free and the home of the brave. This is not a secret in your history books. It's not hard to find and it's there. So they dumped out what you call their worst of the worst. But what you don't know that this worst of the worst was <clears throat> was primarily male, right? And they sent them over here to uh, prepare a cleansing factor for a gene pool. That's the real reason the 13 colonies was set up after the pattern of Israel. 
So this is why they tell that's how the that's how the prophecy was able to be written. Your children will be afflicted in the foreign land for 400 years. It's already planned out. Even now, um, everybody ignoring what I'm saying, but never investigating it. All of the signs have been exhausted. And I'm telling you right now that all of this is coming to a head. So the military campaign was the King George... Now notice his name, George, King George. King George III was the king who instituted what you call the Barristers Association of England. He commissioned it in 1863 in Savannah, Georgia. Now, this is how your barristers, now notice they are barristers. Barrister is a noble class of um uh, royalty in Europe whose job is to mediate and dispense the law of the Levites on behalf of what they call the Goy, the Gentile. So the barrister's job is to make sure that the Goy, the Gentile, is com in compliance with the laws of Levi. So now this is how you get trapped in your system of levies and liens. So the Continental Congress is the treaty negotiation. So now you see the oldest treaty on earth being the Treaty of Peace and Friendship. Now the Moors, no noble Jew Ali, started off as a religious organization and he found out something and he switched from being a religious organization to a civics. What is civics? That's law. Why was Noble Drew Ali starting out as a spiritual man and practicing a, a faith-based doctrine, switching from that into the law? You will never know the way out if you don't know the law. You will never know the way out if you don't know the law. So, somebody had to dig into the law. Somebody had to look for the exit strategy. Somebody have to show us how to get from under the law, under grace, because it is already written. It's in the. It's already written, so you would know that somebody was going to come along that was going to take us from the law to grace. What is grace? Well, grace is when the wisdom of the righteous overtakes you, and it becomes coupled with the love of the divine. Right? This is when you five fifth realize both your silver cord and your gold cord, your kundalini has risen. Your middle pillar has awakened. You have been enlightened. So now you got these two things. You got the knowledge and the wisdom. You have the eternal fire. Now, that puts you outside of the law because now the law is no longer a law that you have to follow by rope. It's not a rote law. It's the law of the soul. And that's why you are told in the New Testament to disregard the laws of the Old Testament. Because it, now remember, Paul told you, let this mind be in you which is in Christ. Right? And another place he said that Christ thought it not a sin to make himself equal with God. He's talking about uh, another part, he said, exalt your mind into the thinking of God. So you elevate your consciousness, right? Once your consciousness is elevated and you begin to see the beauty in creation, you become overtaken. Your mitochondrial then opens up if you're a man. When that, when that happens, the love of the divine floods you. Now you got divine wisdom already. So you have to have that first because what's about to come next, if you do not have the wisdom of the age, will consume your ass and turn you into a lunatic. Now, when that love of the divine come in and the passion turns on, they call it the passion of the Christ. You, If you don't have the wisdom of the divine, you can't control it. It's, you out of control. You are, you, you are just blind rage. So when you see uh, the Nation of Islam tell you that um, power and force without direction is destruction, 
they're telling you that when you turn on, if you have not did the diligence to get your intellect raised high enough, your discipline firm enough to control this energy, it's going to consume you. You're going to be running around like a looney tune in the street laughing and giggling and jumping up and down, but you're all right. You just consume with the passion of the Christ, and you don't have the wisdom yet to control it. So it's going to drive you where you look like you're insane. So the Moors know that Noble Jew Ali said, if, you know, if I woke all y'all up at one time, y'all tear up something. And you see the difference in Martin Luther King from before he met Elijah Muhammad into after. Now, if you look at the I Have a Dream Martin, he's a very eloquent speaker, and he's very, very powerful in his speech. But when you look at him telling you about integrating into a burning house, look in his eyes. You will see that he is no longer influenced by the false aspect of the Christian doctrine. His God gene is turned on. Elijah Muhammad turned on uh, Martin's God gene by giving him very key pieces of information. When he realized that is when he started pointing to um, the early settlers being given land. Now, all this is, is, is key to the military campaign that they told us was slavery. Now, when they set up the 13 colonies out of England, France, and Spain, they were setting up uh, what the same thing that America set up in Guantanamo Bay. They were prison colonies. And they put them over here thinking and hoping that the natives would wipe them out, which um, some of them they did. And I'm going to pause here to give greetings to all of the people that's listening. And uh, I'm, I'm trying to keep this as on the... Okay, so now, in the law, we go from the Continental Congress to the Declaration of Independence. Now read it. Every single complaint, without exception, the only thing that's different is time adjustment for technology and advancement. That's the only thing that's missing from the Declaration of Independence. If you read it, every single complaint we are having right now. Now, if the person that wanted you away from those things, they wouldn't reinstitute it. That's the first problem. The person that took you away from all that wouldn't want you back there. This is what you call a revolution. 360 degrees, you right back where you started. Stop saying revolution. You do not want a revolution. You want a revolt. You want an uprising. You want to rise up above the circumstance and condition. You don't want to go a revolution because we just did that. You've seen the American Revolution. What happened? Everything complained about in the Declaration of Independence has came full circle back to the same complaint right now. 200 years later. Everything. Same exact complaints, excessive taxation, um, the, all of the uh, restrictions of the law, the same thing, but that's how it got there. So, from the Declaration of Independence, you had, uh, before your Constitution, you had your Articles of Confederation. The Articles of Confederation was the agreement of the 13 outcast colonies, Guantanamo Bays, where the insurrection of the prisoners, they overthrew the, they overthrew the warden in the 13 colonies with the help of the natives. So when they overthrew the wardens, they had to come up with an allegiance in order to survive because they know that the warden is sending somebody. He's sending troops. Now this is what you call your, your American Revolutionary War. England now has to respond to the 13 colonies, one, making an allegiance. That's your Articles of Confederation had nothing to do with any other natives. The natives didn't have anything to do with any of that. The Articles of Confederation was agreement made between the 13 colonies. Now, the natives were under something called the Iroquois 
um, constitution or the Iroquois Confederation, the Iroquois Nations. And this ha this is under this is in a more Inca. That's where you get your uh, false term America for. It's a it's a misnomer. And they telling you it's named after Amerigo Vespucci. No, it's not. It's Amur Inca. The people, the Inca people were on both sides of the water because what they told you was Africa is a far Inca. Inca is the term. In African languages, it's Aksum. Aksum is Aksumi. It's dark skinned woolly. It's talking about the original nine ether people that came here. With, that's, the, that's the Inca. It's the Aksum. The Aksum in Africa is what they call them. And over here they call them Inca. And this is why your Omex and your Aztecs and your Mayans are. If you look at the at the petroglyphs and the hieroglyphs, you will see the coloring of the skin tones. And so um, the war now is against the 13 colonies. There's an all-out assault by France, England, and Spain to conquer the 13 colonies. But something happened. Somebody from France discovered in when Fort Detroit was conquered by Chief Pontiac and a piece of information was exchanged from the chief of Two Feathers with a Templar. This piece of information allowed the French to realize that they didn't want no more parts of this. So now you get your Eiffel Tower um, connection to the Statue of Liberty that's holding up the torch in the land that the Son of Man would return in. And the Son of Man would have to return in the area where it matched the Orion belt because he would have to be one of the Orianos. Um, so he would have to be in the United States. The only place there's three Orions is Orion, Lake Orion, Orion Township in the state of Michigan, which is the right hand of the mother, Mother Earth. And the only way that the one could rise is he would have to be the son of man, but he would have to be seduced by a jinn. Now, this is the legacy of Solomon. So when you go through what they call the demons of Solomon, you find out he fell in love with the jinn. This is your Hiram story because the jinn had to be born under the zodiacal sign of the Leo. The jinn being born under the zodiacal sign of the Leo represented the Sphinx which takes us back to the three Orions once again. And the Sphinx being the queen of heaven and earth, Isis. So one of the daughters of Isis that was represented as a gen in the genetic cleanup, being the first selected, as um, they say in Genesis, and they pick all of whom they chose. And so that being the first one. So then you hear in the Nation of Islam, they talk about, um, Master Farrar Muhammad's mother, Mimi, um, and how he was born half original. All that had a lot of, um, what you call infused, uh, holographic light ray. It's, it's like light. Like I said yesterday, when the gods realized that they're gods, they don't have to encode um, organic matter um, in a computer chip. They can encode rays of light. So what do you do? You alchemically charge a word, like my mystic name Morpheus is an alchemically charged name to liberate oppressed people. So when you look at the name, it is, it is rooted in Orpheus. Orpheus was the patron saint of the orphans, which is part of my responsibility being uh, fused to the African law by the name of um, Baron Samadhi, who is um, the patron saint of war, of mixed seed babies, of orphans, of black people. So he in charge, he got to govern all that. So now, as the mortal man, the regular self, the uh, social construct, I have to break from the social construct. I have to break from the traditions of the land that I live and tie it into my ancestral energy. This wakens up the wisdom, 
And now the only thing is the Queen of Heaven and Earth got to send somebody. So this person would have to be born under the zodiacal sign of Leo in order for the son to be able to follow the breadcrumbs of Hansel and Gretel. That's not uh, just a regular fairy tale. It is also an alchemically charged story. All of these stories are alchemically charged, just like your religious texts of the world. There are key factors in there in the alchemy. So when you hear uh, certain things, there are certain parts of the self that respond to it, light body. Now, let's get back to this American history. <clears throat> so they told us after these colonies and from the time England was coming over here around maybe 15 something they start bringing Africans over here and slaves in bondage now what most people 99.9% .9 don't realize when they say middle passage what do they mean everybody think that mean the trip from Ghana and the Ivory Coast and the slave coast over across the Atlantic to them to here mainland America that's not what the middle passage was the Middle Passage was what you call, what they was trying to call the breaking process. So this is where they wanted you to know that all of the torture took place. The torture was to bring the vibration of earth down in order for this wickedness to be able to progress. So what they was telling you with the breaking of the slave, they wasn't actually that. It was a, a blood rite. It had to be a complete and total massacre in order to get the vibration low enough for the dirt that had to unfold next. You have to spill a certain amount of blood in order to bring the vibration of the planet and the people's emotive senses. Their, that, that sense of emotional apathy and depression has to set in. The sense of all of the blood spilling does that. This is why they keep us in war. As long as we shed each other's blood in mass around the world, inner city killings, um, celebrity homicide, inner city homicide, warfare, conflict, discord. This keep all of the people like kind of like on edge, or at e ill at ease. So now they're subtly depressed. You can control them easier that way. Now all of this is written in the Sumerian tablets, and they're not gonna release them probably for a couple more years. But the particular tablet is the blueprint of how to colonize, take over, and control an entire population of a planet by an outside force. So, if they have the blueprint, why not use it? You got the blueprint for conquest, why not use it? Because there's no sense of having it. Now, we can point the finger at everybody else, but we have to go to what the African always taught. The simplest answer is most likely the solution, is the first thing. The simplest answer is most likely the solution. The next thing they say is, if you can't use it, then it's useless, then it's in your way. You have to dispose of anything you can't use. So if an African got a hold of the blueprint, he's going to use it. Why? Because otherwise, he don't feel he would have came into contact with it. So now... When we look at the American Revolution, when they're fighting against England, you've got this guy that pops on the scene named George Washington. Now, George Washington, you know, fighting all of these battles. And they're telling us that he's fighting on behalf of the colonies. Now, revisionist historians are starting to tell us that George Washington was a British spy. And revisionist histories are telling us that he was a British plant. Why are they saying this? Because this is exactly what happened. Now, we don't have to go back to George Washington to see it. We can look to this recent conflict in Afghanistan. After America had went over there and subdued all of the political and religious authority in that country, they couldn't just leave and pull out because it would have been left total chaos. So what did they do? They install what they call a preliminary leader. Who is the preliminary leader in, this, in the revolution? George Washington. This is why they call him the first president. But he's not the president of, of we the people, of the land, of the, the native nine tax, the five-fifth realized people. He was never their leader.
His title is the Commander in Chief of the Armed Forces of the United States of America. That ain't us. That ain't us. Their central office of business is in a is in the enclave. It's in the uh, what you call a city state called Washington District of Columbia. That don't got nothing to do with us. Our capital, when they negotiated the um, the Continental Congress and everything, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Philly, the city of brotherly love is named that for a reason. Is named the city of brotherly love for a reason. Because they wanted you to remember. So they left it as a clue. All that stuff is clues. It's a gazillion signs and a gazillion clues. And I can go through them days and days and days. How to unearth it clue by clue. But it takes so much time. Now. When you go to your history books. Your history books going to show you the cracked Liberty Bell. But they don't know how it got cracked. Nor do they realize that the crack is the symbol of lightning. So the lightning strikes the Liberty Bell. What does the Liberty Bell represent? The sound of freedom. So now, if the sound of freedom is represented by the Liberty Bell and they crack it, what are they telling you? They are going to put a crack in the voice of freedom. How do you do it? Adversarial system. So, go back in your history books and you're going to find this being said on your so-called Senate floor. We must maintain the appearance of an adversarial system. The appearance don't mean there's adversaries there, but it just looks like it is. If you're going to keep a people divided in order to conquer them, you have to make it look like there's always a voice against the rulership. But in actuality, if you control both sides of the conflict, you don't care who wins. Because you're going to win either way. So you get the Amhill Rothschild saying, I care not who make your laws as long as I can control the money. Now, go back to the writings of Thomas Paine and Alexander Hamilton, etc. You will find they was writing and they was warning about something called a central banking system. Right? So now, before we get to the central banking system, we got to get to uh, Abraham Lincoln from George Washington. George Washington was installed by King George III as his general because there was nobody over here to make him a general. He didn't work for nobody over here, but he was General George Washington. And so this is where they can deceive um, uh People that seasoned in the law, they can deceive them right here. As soon as you try to use their system to escape their system, you are like a tick. You're digging deeper and deeper. When you use legal terminologies recognized by their system, you are operating in the system of levy and lien. If you are not a barrister, you have no standing in the jurisdiction of the barrister. That's why you need an attorney to speak for you. You're not a barrister. You are not a member of the bar. You are not the subject matter. The, the system of levy and liens has nothing to do with organic humans. It has nothing to do with your physical framework. It has everything to do with paper. It has everything to do with writing. It scribes. They are scribbling, writing, spelling. This is all of the law. That's why you got to learn a whole other language to learn law. It's the spell. Now, <clears throat> when you look at the history and you, and, you, and you don't really give it an opinion, right, the conflicts and the wars, you can see how they sent George Washington, the general, who was made a general in England. He wasn't made a general in the United States. Read his history and you'll automatically notice. It's, it's not hard. And they installed him as the interim president, the first one, because they overthrew the regime of the Confederates under the Articles of Confederation. And they never tell you it was a civil war north against the south, which is some more garbage. The war was England imposing their will on natives. England. The French 
realizing that this was the land, what they say is the lightning shines from the east even unto the west, there shall the coming of the Son of Man be. The Templars who came over here as via kings. Via king mean a vicarious king, king that's empowered to act on behalf of a king in his absence. So they gave him rulership of something called the high seas, the via kings. What did they do? They implemented something called the Code of Thieves. If you don't know what that is, go watch Pirates of the Caribbean. That's Puerto Rico. Under the Code of Kings, all those considered as thieves. Now notice the word thieves and thieves are the same word. Thieves and thieves. B and V are interchangeable under Grimm's Law Grammar. When you're coming from Latin into English, remember that. The, the Code of Thebes is the Code of Thebes. The Code of Thebes was written by Kali. Why? There was a bunch of patriarchal uh, warmongers that wanted to hoard the wealth. And so she organized a group called Thuggy. The Thuggy job was catch these patriarchal, sociopathic, greedy um, hoarders on their travels and take their shit and feed as many of these poor people and these babies as you can with it. Now you got your Robin Hood story. Now they're telling you the Robin Hood story, the real story. So they were commissioned by Kali to keep the balance in nature. Think about that for a minute. Now, they villainized Kali as a destructive demon of murderous thugs. But they never tell you that what she was doing and why she commissioned her priests, who was like almost like, like the uh, martial artist, to go out and rob these people. So now let's get back to our American history. Now, the South had these... Uh, Plantations set up as work camps. The original um, workers for the work camps were called indentures. The indentures were coming from Ireland and Scotland, and they used deception, trickery, and the poison of the land, and the killing off of the priests under St. Patrick. It took them a couple hundred years to subdue Ireland and Scotland. And when they did that, they brought them over here and tricked them. And they would—they told them they could never be free. Now, you have to know the history of England, of Ireland and Scotland, and you understand why they call Europe's redhead stepchild. Now, I'm not going to go deep into it. I'm going to tell you all to follow Queen Scotta. Because when they kidnapped Sacagawea, and when they kidnapped Pocahontas, they did it because they had auburn red hair. And they thought that they were the redhead princess who was about to give birth to the one they called the Christ. So that was the big deal about Sacagawea and Pocahontas for real. But they wasn't the ones, they wasn't the redhead princess because they didn't match. When they took them to England to show them to the priest who had the Templars subdued over there in France, in Paris, the city of Isis where the Eiffel Tower is, to commemorate the fall, so that they could send the statue over here to light the way when they realized that those were not the ones and that redhead princess is over here somewhere, so they got to find her in the French. Realizing this, realizing what had been done by the French, they wanted to bag out, but they couldn't because they had already made a protectorate arrangement with the traditional natives. This this is your uh, uh, setting up of the fort of New Orleans. New Orleans was a military post where once the natives had uh, fought against uh, all the Spanish, French, and English forces and kept them away, they couldn't penetrate. So they made the agreement with France to protect the main body of the mainland and out of this came a land grant, a series of land grants, actually, to the 13 colonies in order for them to establish an economic base and be self-sufficient. Now, what happened? At the time, 
the islands, um, Hispaniola, with Cuba, the Dominican Republic, and Haiti, and all of these islands, this is where all of the so-called slave trading is taking place. They only bring us very specific individuals from down there to the mainland. They don't want them thick-blooded, um, rebellious Negroes on this side of the, of the mainland. They don't want them over here infecting the minds of their good Negroes. They, they can't have that. It won't make, the system can't work. Haitian Revolution is your reference. So this is why if they caught anybody doing traditional African religious practice, they put them to death, the Haitian Revolution, because they couldn't do the genetic cleanup under the eugenics program of Enki if they allowed it to happen like it did in Haiti. So this is why the Africans had to conceal their traditional religion under the Catholic religion of Christianity. Now notice they chose the Catholic and not the Protestant, because under the Protestant religion, they were allowed to use the symbolical representations on their altars. But under the Catholic representation, they were. Our ancestors were no fools because they knew that the whole biblical framework was rooted in what you call African conjure. And so, the black people have been told they were slaves. Watch the war march. King Leopold called what they called the Berlin Conference. The Berlin Conference divided Africa up. The interior of Africa was off limits to all invasion. Enki was no part of this because Enki had activities taking place in this part of the Americas. When Enlil realized Enki's back was turned, he lent the all-out assault on his children. At the, this is called, in your history books, the Berlin Conference, where they divided Africa up for its wealth. Because if you break um, from the punishment early in its totality, then you cannot reap the rewards that you did when you gave your sacrifice. So Haiti, even though they broke the bondage of Napoleon's army with the conjure, there was one thing they weren't allowed to have prematurely, and that was the luxury of the wealth. Because they couldn't, if they would have got their wealth before now, they would have failed now. Now, Haiti got to understand this. If, according to the contract, when we took our penance for that dirt that them some bitches did in Babylon, when we accepted the responsibility of cleaning up these genetics, when that one drop of blood doctrine had to be out front so everybody understood that the blood was necessary part of it, when they had to tell you that America was the melding pot, so that you understood that you had to mix genetics in America. This is part of the country. This is the makeup. And this is why that the black people had to be at the bottom. Because there is no way that they would freely give up the genetics on top. And the European at that time they were given power had never had an empire. So they had to have a right to rule an empire. The, Ro Holy, Roland, the Holy Roman Empire. They had to have that right to rule so they could know what it feel like. To have self-worth and self-value. For what them rotten bastards did in Babylon to them people was so fucking wrong. And they never had a sense of a family. So they had to learn all of these things. Once they learned all these things, now we can start to clean it up for real, for real. This is the last mile of the way. This is the hard part. This is the part where we don't want to touch them. They don't want to touch us either. Because... We carbon-based, they sulfur-based. That's, the, that's how they was able to get them under the radar. By putting the sulfur in them and foregoing the carbon. This is how they was able to get them under the radar. And this is why it took so long to discover the atrocity. Now, over here, they show you in the law what they're doing. All right, now they tell you flat out, ignorance of the law is no excuse. Meaning that because you don't know what the law is, you are not excused from the punishment. Now, why would they tell, why would you have to be punished for something that you don't know is wrong? You have to be a baby. You have to be some type of infant or imbecile. And now when you go to the law and you look up what the term black mean, and you start to realize that it means dead and imbecile or 
somebody that cannot take care of themselves, then you start to have a whole other perspective of the law. They never freed a slave because there was never a slave to free. An emancipation proclamation is not a freedom of a slave. To emancipate something is like when you let your dog out the house, you emancipate him into your backyard. He can roam your whole backyard without you bothering him. He's emancipated to the backyard. A declaration just means I say you can be this. I declare. And he's tell us that in, uh, in history class that a declaration, you have to make an open declaration of something. I can declare you can roam about. Now, this is how you know there was no slavery. That emancipation, that declaration of emancipation, if it was, it would have been executive order of a manumission or an executive order of a liberation. Those things mean that you are a full competent adult able to take care of yourself. You are a rational being able to know right from wrong and that you need nobody to speak on your behalf, and you don't need to be subject to the subject matter of the Barristers Association to shuffle the paper of the laws of the levies and the liens. You don't know that, then you subject to their jurisdiction because you are incompetent. They become what they call in your law, parent regis, your royal parent, your parent at large, extemporaneous, your parent at, on the spot, if you look in the law and you look up parental rights, you will find there's three parents to a child. The mother, the father, and the state. Now, how did the state get to be part and party to you? Because you signed a birth certificate. The birth certificate is a contract. It tells you right in the word what it is. It's a contract. Now, remember I told you earlier, the body is a lot. The body is a lot. Right? What is a lot? A tract. What is a tract? A piece of land. And they form man from the dust of the earth. A lot. A tract. They kind in you out of your tract, your body. How do they get it? They get you to perform work, labor. Your exertion and ignorance on their behalf to empower them is an automatic subjugation of yourself and you don't know it. Now, when you go into there, you will realize that the judge is a barrister, the prosecutor is a barrister, and your attorney is a barrister. It's an automatic conflict of interest. Automatic conflict of interest because you're the only non-barrister participating. How can that be adjudicated fairly? Because you're not one of them. You don't know what the barristers do in their social time because you're not a barrister. You don't know the mechanism of the system of levy and liens because you're not a barrister. They talk about all this stuff in their uh, bar meeting and gatherings. And all of them be there, the lawyer, the judge, the magistrate, um, all of them are there. Now, as you track it through your law, it tells you about a junk court. What is an a junk? That's a partial court. That means that it ain't real. And it tells you where the real courts are. Um, but they still don't have jurisdiction of a five-fifth realized because there can only be one judge under grace. But if you under the law, if you under the system of levy and liens, you are a victim to their system. So the son of man got to get you from under the system of, the, of being a victim. But you got to speak up for yourself. Now, you can't speak up for yourself if you don't really understand what's going on in front of you. you being deceived into being a servant of your own enemy. This is why they say you worship the devil. Because the word devil only mean your enemy. It only mean your enemy. It don't mean no man with no pitchfork and no horns. No, it mean enemy. And anything that's evil is a thing that's against your greatest good. Anything in your path that's going to interfere with you being your greatest good is what your evil is. Now, let me go through and see if anybody had any questions. Okay. Now, so you hear the Moors, and you'll see them on YouTube. They're showing you how to use the barrister's system. They're showing you. But they're digging themselves in deeper. Why? They're negotiating treaties alone without the tribe. You need to try. One of y'all going in there to negotiate a treaty. 
You're not under the levies and lien if you five fifth realize. So you cannot go in there and argue subject matter because you're not subject to that matter. When you start arguing subject matter, you're negotiating the treaty without the tribe and without tribal consent, you are called a rogue. You're called a rogue at that time in law. You are a pirate on the high seas. You just stranded yourself. You can't go to war without the clan. Moors, pay attention. You can't do it without the clan. You have to speak in unison in one voice. This is what they don't want you to know. When you're going in and you start arguing subject matter, you are submitting to their authority. You can't argue the subject matter. You're negotiating treaty. As soon as you are more, I'm more Inca. As soon as you are one of them and you go in there and start arguing subject matter, you negotiate a treaty without the consent of the clan. You're a pirate on the high seas. You just hijacked yourself. They finna board your ship and they finna bring your ass down. This is why Noble Drew Ali said, study this law. Study it. And you realize every time you go in there and you declare that you are sovereign, you just submit it to the authority because now you're negotiating the treaty. You're negotiating the treaty by asserting your sovereignty. You're not arguing the jurisdiction. You're arguing subject matter. As soon as you start arguing subject matter, you go from being under grace to the law. You just condemned yourself. Now you got to fight it on their terms. All of your tools that you had when you came in there, you didn't use them correctly. It's military strategy. You're walking into their system of levies and liens, and you're arguing their subject matter, a matter that has nothing to do with you. You're a barrister. You're not a barrister. You are more Inca. You're more. So you go in there and you negotiate treaty without the clan. You can't do that. As soon as you do that, you declare the pirate a rogue. And when they declare you a rogue, they bring the wrath of their court system down on you harder than anybody else. And you can't free yourself from the bondage by putting the shackles on yourself. You, you can only free yourself from the bondage by letting them know that you see the game for what it is. And you're not going to negotiate a treaty without the clan. So why do they drag you in there to negotiate a treaty? <clears throat> they tell you when they issued the warrant. What's a warrant? A war rant. Look up the word rant. It means somebody is screaming irate. I declare war. So now, all war is not physical. We fight not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. What is a principality? It's a principle, a point. We fight against the point. What's the point? Getting from under the Levite law to under the grace of the righteousness. You can't walk in righteousness if you don't know what the righteousness is or how to get from under the wickedness. You got to get yourself free because righteousness is in the freedom itself. It's not in, it's not in the oppression. The oppression and the misery is the bondage. The liberation that comes with liberating of, of, of yourself is the freedom. And that's when you start, that's why I say, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven. And then it tell you that the kingdom of heaven is within you. What are they telling you? If you, if you, Turn on that gold light and that silver light. And now, and now you five-fifth realize, you know, wait a minute. This is the Levite system. This ain't nothing, nothing to do with me. I'm not a barrister. I'm not under the goy. I'm not the bondage servant that they say that I need to be under their laws that need to be governed by the barristers or the goy. The barristers are the ones, they are um, what you call Gentiles, commissioned by the Levites to enforce law. The system of levies and liens. They're using the Uniform Commercial Code because it's the Code of Thieves. The UCC is the entire Code of Thieves. It's the entire blueprint for taking over everybody's money on earth. It's called the Uniform Commercial Code. That is the Code of Thieves. If you don't know how to navigate it, you're going to dig yourself in so deep that they're going to bury you so far you'll never find your way back home. But it's simple. 
Once you become five fifth realized, once you understood your history, you've never been a slave. You was a POW. When they did that march to divide Africa up under the orders of Enlil, when they did that march to divide Africa up, they could only do so much before a backlash or a hawk to it was. And you can see it when King Leopold sent Cecil Rhodes into the Congo. Because, see, they know that the Son of Man has to be crowned in the Congo. They know this. So if he got to be crowned in the Congo, they got to control that so they can stop it. Right? So King Leopold sent Cecil Rhodes down there. Cecil Rhodes unleashed a terror that make Hitler look like a gardener. But we don't talk about that. We don't talk about that. Because nobody want to accept the reality that um, we turned our backs on the enemy and they sacked us. See, if the son of man didn't have to go through do all this genetic cleaning up, it would have never happened. It would have never happened. They already know. They already know. So here you go. The son of man going to be crowned in the Congo. They know this. They know where. And then you can see what they did to pollute it. How they spilt the blood all over the land of the people to keep the vibration low. And all that blood is part of the blood and the rights. As long as they spill that blood, they can keep the vibration long enough, low enough to run. So now, um, when they told us we were slaves, the plantation systems were set up. But you got to pay attention to what happened on the plantation system, and you can see the genetic cleanup at play. The plantation system, these Europeans who was put over them as overseers and slave drivers was perpetually raping women generation after generation. They own daughters. Their daughter, granddaughter, great grand, four, five generations. But all of them at the end of what they called the emancipation looked European. Where did they go? Where did they go? After they so-called freed the so-called slaves, where did all of the um, quadroons and octroons that you could not distinguish their African heritage from their European heritage? Where did they go? Now, you got to remember the doctrine, one drop of blood. And you got to remember the motto, the great melding pot. When you put it all together, it starts making sense. So, look at the movie Imitation of Life. It's showing you. Mama gave birth to this octoroon baby, right? She, she can pass. Where'd she go? And now, look. go back to the photographs. Start looking at the picture of the naked people from when they started taking photographs and follow them to now. Follow them all the way up. And you'll see the bodies of the people starting to change. That's the genetic cleanup. Does somebody want me to talk about Pancho Villa? <laughs> anyway, so we're going into their system deceived already. Now, this was the big this was the big plan because they knew about the genetic cleanup in play. So watch what they did. They know that um, if these what look like white people ever figure out. That we all in slavery over here, they is too. They gonna tear this motherfucker up. I seen a, a show on YouTube not too long ago. This white dude said, you think they built all them prisons for black people? Black people don't have a history of rebelling against the system. They built them prisons so when these white boys rebelled. There's a white dude was talking. I was blue back because he knew what was going on. Now, in another video I had called The Conscious Community is a Problem, I told y'all it was a conscious white community as well. And they are. But what most people are not realizing is when you go back and you review J. A. Rogers, Sex and Race, and Nature Knows No Color Line. Now, go back and review who J. A. Rogers was. 
He had no degrees. He had no um, alphabets behind his name. He was what you call an unlearned, uh, unlettered scholar. And he give you references for everything. But he's showing you this for a reason. Now, if you look at the time frame, early 1900s, he's telling you then. Now, they told you that Barack Hussein Obama was the first black president. If you go, Jay Rogers wrote a book called Five Black Presidents. But that ain't got nothing to do with who our true president was, John Hansen. John Hansen was the, was the first president of the Continental Congress, and he was what you call the Blackamoor. He was the Blackamoor, and um, he was a real good friend with one that the Moors called Ben Bay, which y'all know him as Benjamin Banneker, the designer of Washington, D.C. Even though he designed D.C., D.C., this is the trick about D.C., D.C. is de designed to do something alchemically. So what they did when they moved the capital of what it used to be called the Northwest Trading Company, and it was the largest slave trading um, company out of Europe, but they was not just trading slaves. The slaves were POWs that they sacked when they launched the all out assault on the motherland. Those were POWs. But you got to remember, they also launched that same assault on Ireland and Scotland. Right? Why did they do that? What do the word Irish mean and where does it come from? The word Irish comes from the word, the African word, Orisha. Because the St. Patrick was sent in to kill off Orisha priests. Where do the Orisha priests come from? Do your history. So Benjamin Banneker was designing D.C. And when he was setting up what you call the obelisk in the layout of the land, he was performing what you call an alchemical rite. He was sealing the land. So when the apostles time was up, they couldn't hold on. He was sealing it. But they were under the impression that he was doing a Masonic rite over there that would keep them in power. And so they helped. They participated in breaking the spell themselves by thinking they knew more than what they really did. And so this is why they tell you that the Masons often deceive their brothers because they have to in order to make the program work. And so the blue lines ain't going to tell the red lines what they're doing. Remember that. So the right hand ain't going to let the left hand know what it's doing because you got the program has to be done. So the law you trapped in is a Judaic law. The judges are Judites, right? The system is set up by Levi, the system of levies and liens. The system of levies and liens set up by Levi is uh, overseen by barristers, right? The barristers are um, a, a rank of royalty um, among the Goy or the Gentiles that were commissioned to enforce the system of levies and liens for the um, Levi, the Levites. Now, if once they start to enforce it under the barristers, now they had to get it into your country. They had to get it over here in the Amur Inca. And they had to distract you from the name. Now, if you really want to know how to crack the code, look and research very in-depth the term style and title. Then look at all your so and look at all your war ranks. And you will notice that the style and title are they must don't want me talking to y'all. Okay, so now the whole thing of slavery is the grand deception to keep you from realizing that if you become five fifth realized, you have first claim of right to the physical three-fifth biological body matrix. You got first claim of rights when you five-fifth realize to the physical corpus. Having first claim of right, there's nobody other than the Christ that can assert a claim of right above you because the Christ is the only judge of us all, right? So they don't want you to know how to get from under their system, so they try to trap you back in it by keeping you in the circle. How do they do that? They give you misinformation. 
They plant plants in your society to tell you that um, this is how you get out of their system, but it's digging you deeper into their system because you're arguing subject matter. All right? Now, follow the trail of the barristers. There were no barristers before 1863, but we still had judicial systems. Think about that. They were called tribal courts. Go look it up. It's not a secret. They still have tribal courts. Now, they got a whole bunch of books about treaties against what they call uh, Native Affairs. How did we get from 13 colonies to the entire country being overlaid by this company called Washington, D.C. or United States? Check it out. The French trying to get from... They don't want to suffer the wrath of the Son of Man. They trying to get away from this land. So they sold the rights to protect this land to England. You know it as the purchase of New Orleans or the New Orleans Port Purchase or the Louisiana Purchase. Now, the part that they don't tell you, that the only thing that they bought in the Louisiana Purchase is the Port of New Orleans, which is a 33-mile area. That's all they bought. And by buying that, that was the military control center to protect the what then was called the Western Territories, because it was everything west of the Rockies, south of the Canadian border. And it went all the way down into um, the northern portion of South America that the French were the protectorate of. The French sold their colonies to the Spaniards. They wanted no more parts of it because the Templar um, that spoke with Chief Pontiac had gave him the inside scoop on they had not caught the redhead princess and that the wrath of the son of man would not be merciful on France, Notre Dame. Pay attention. The wrath of the son of man would not be merciful on France. It will only be as merciful as the queen say it shall be. Notre Dame. Now, so, in the system that they have you trapped in, it's a system of levies and liens. They have you arguing the subject matter as a sovereign. The minute you do that, you just buried yourself because you are a pirate. You are a pirate. Now, if you go and look, Look in the legal books, look up the term despot, D-E-S-P-O-T. When you look that term up, this is what happens when somebody goes into a system like this and negotiate treaty without their tribal leader. When your tribal leader not there, you negotiate it, you, call, you become what they call a despot in law. You are despotic. You are taking it up on yourself to assert your position where the chief belongs. In every country around the world follow the ancient code of kings about the despot king. The despot king, the only thing for a despot is death. That's why they consider you dead because they know if you was five fifth realized you wouldn't dare speak up without permission of the chief. Who would be the chief? The son of man. How do you know? Because it tells you in Revelations that the queen of heaven and earth is going to crown him king of king and lord of lords. So if she's going to crown him king of king and lord of lords, then that would make him be the crown prince. That would give him the highest authority on the planet. Then give him the highest authority on the planet. Your tribal chieftains of all of your indigenous tribes have the most powerful piece of legislation on the world stage before them, and it's called the Indigenous Rights Act of the United Nations. Read it, study it. Stop negotiating treaty without your clan, if you are more. If you negotiate treaty without the clan, you're a pirate, you're a despot, and you are considered dead. You are considered dead and adrift on the high seas. Go and do your research and find out what happens to the dead and the drift on the high seas. You become what you call the booty.
They swoop you up into the ship, take control of that which is uncontrolled. Now, the rape campaign that went on in the plantations was part of the genetic cleanup. The freeing or the liberating of them, the allowing of them to go out in the populace, in order to make it more appealing, they had to put restrictions on it. Because we naturally, by nature, don't want to follow the law of Levi because the law of Levi ties us back into what we call that Old Testament guy, uh, Yahweh, who is in Leo, who is what would you call the devil or the prince of this or the king of this world now. But now he got to surrender the throne. Now he got to go. And now that he got to go, he not resisting. He ready to leave. But y'all ain't ready to receive the queen of heaven and earth and the son of man. Because all of the people was confused as to what's going on right in their very face. But you think you was a slave, you was a POW. Now, when you start going through what took place, you it start making more sense. Now, <clears throat> you got a guy named David Walker that wrote something called David Walker's Appeal. Read it. Appeal. You appeal a court case. Think about that. David Walker's Appeal. He's appealing to who? He said, the freed men concerning the ones in bondage. They wasn't in on that shit. They wasn't on board with it because they wasn't following the rules. So David Walker protested. And so we call those who have positions of authority in our community that don't quite talk black enough Uncle Times. And we are trapped up in all of these false ideologies and misnomers. The story of Uncle Tom, Uncle Tom's cabin, <laughs> y'all should read. And you will find out that Uncle Tom was the one that set off the slave revolt. There has never been a record of a field nigger trying to overthrow a slave, a slave plantation. Every single one, Denmark Basie, Gabrielle Prosser, um, Nat Turner, wherever you can find one at, they was always either uh, what you considered a house nigga or a mulatto. They was either considered a house nigga or a mulatto. Today we would say they would be a, a house nigga all the time. Now, they gave us those terms to use derogatorily against one another when they see us progressing in order to keep the disunity there. But they never told you that Uncle Tom, even though he starts off smiling and jeffing, he was just trying to figure out how to get in and take the plantation over. That's all he wanted to know. So he did. And when he figured it out, he set it off. And the, just like that novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin, Uncle Tom set it off, most of the people stopped reading because they got disgusted with Uncle Tom in the early chapters, and they didn't finish reading the book, so they start calling people Uncle Tom without the whole story. Now, the house nigga, as they call him, always was the ones fighting for freedom. The field nigga didn't ever fight for freedom. Because he don't give a shit about doing no work. Work don't mean nothing to him. He don't like all that stuff they doing to the women and the children. But the work part was irrelevant. There's, there was no man, there's no man in Africa that has passed his rights of passage as a man that's going to sit back and refuse to work. Now, that wasn't the problem, the picking of the kind of, they, the whole of the, what they telling us was the hanging and the lynches was to keep us from stopping them from abusing the women. It's not in our nature to allow women to be chronically abused like that. So all of the ones of us that rebelled against it, they put to death. And then they start trying to separate the wise from the youth, the age from the youth. They don't want the older ones. They don't want the 50-year-old thug that then been through it all, did his time, paid his pence to come back and tell that 18-year-old dude, let me show you, man, how the game really go. That's part of that divide and conquer that started in Babylon that, in Leo laid down. 
And so here we see it that there's a whole bunch of things taking place right before our very eyes, but we don't know what that is. Why did they pass a law last year commemorating 400 years of your service in, in America? There was a big thing on the floor of the, of the Senate, Congress, or whatever the hell it was, but they was talking about it, and nobody caught it. Nobody caught that Marcus Garvey said, look for me in the cyclone, and Cyclone Marcus hit in March of last year, right before they did the speech. Nobody caught it. Nobody caught the king of Ghana with the collective of the chieftains apologizing for the diaspora and the uh, loss of the war. He didn't apologize for anything got nothing to do with slavery. He said for losing a war. He said we was outgunned and outmanned and we didn't see it coming. He told you it was a war. Now, if you go now, and there's a, uh, another African head of state. Uh, what's that country? He um, he over there telling them now, y'all ain't finna do it no more. Africans always had the means to stop it, but because of the cleanup necessary, they wouldn't stop it. Wakanda. That's why they cut me off last yesterday. The elders did that because they didn't want me to tell y'all go too deep into that yesterday about the Wakanda. That's not an uh, accident. The Wakanda story, not just a story. It's not an accident. And I'm not going to get into that because I kind of touched on Black Panther in, in, the, in the prior video. I'm not, I don't want to get off that. So now they told us we were slaves right before they implemented what you call Jim Crow. Now, go to Black Labor, White Wealth, and read it. Read all of the political positions that we had. Uh, all of the strategic positions that um, Claude Anderson is telling us we had before the Jim Crow law. We was in Senate and Congress. We was in all of that. But then all of a sudden they started phasing us out. And we've been thinking or led to believe it was about our dark skin. It wasn't. They was trying to keep us permanently oppressed so they can allow those who were passing to send a wave of that one drop of blood through the European community without realizing in two, three generations who they are. Because it that's why all of the early American records that was the most important, if you notice, all of those record houses, courts, City halls, schools, they all burn the records because they don't want people tracing their lineage and find out that there's no more white people in America that's been here over 50 years. They don't want y'all to know that. The one drop of blood, the eugenics program, the cleanup program, the gene program laid down by Ia or Inky. Inky knew what he was doing. He knew how to clean it up. He knew all they needed was that solar rate. So now, when you look at the photographs and you see the body structures change, now you have to look at your leadership. Because they've been having you believe that um, Dubois and Garvey are bitter enemies. And Garvey and, and, and Dubois kept it up. Why would they do that? If you're going to fight, divide, and conquer, you need a horse. You need a dog in every fight. No matter where it's at. If you're going to fight, divide, and conquer, you need a fucking dog in every fight. Hey, Goldie. If you don't have a dog in every fight, right, you automatically lost. If in one fight go, okay, so now watch this. Okay, go sit down now. It's enough. I didn't want you in this fight. If you don't have a dog in the fight, you lost. General George Patton set up something called a Black Panther Brigade. The Black Panther Brigade was one of the baddest military brigades in World War II. Now, pay attention to General Patton. Now, watch what happened. He exalted these people. He told the American government, these Black Panther Brigade members are going to save this country from sure death. Right? Where did they go when the war was over? Where did they, they didn't go to South Central. They didn't go to L.A. 
Where did they go? They went to Mississippi. In Mississippi, they set up something called the Black Panther Party. Well, the government had to have a contingency for that because if they're going to protect this country, then they got to find a way to control them. So they got to get on the inside. So now, what do they do? Um, how did UEP and Bobby come up with the term Black Panther Party for self-defense? Ask them. Bobby will tell you. I heard about a group down in Mississippi called the Black Panther Party, and they didn't take that crap from them, from them, uh, from them crackers down there. They armed up because they said they had a constitutional right to do so. So being, um, if you really listen and you really, really pay attention, Huey wasn't very smart. He got a whole lot of credit for doing some shit. Huey wasn't very smart. Listen to him speak. He wasn't very, he wasn't very, uh, um, in depth in his, in his intellectual prowess. But he wasn't an idiot either. Don't get me wrong. But listen to Bobby. You hear, uh, focused, concentrated delivery. Something going on here. Now, you had to ask Bobby Seale because he was there. I wasn't. He'll tell you what went on. He'll tell you who's who and what's what. And so, you see this Black Panthers form the Black Panther Party in Mississippi. Pretty soon in California, the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense spring up. Then you had your New York Party, Chicago Party, Producing Fred Hampton and Mark Clark. George Patton, the white man, told the white government, these Negroes going to save the country. And we ain't watching. Okay, now, let's get away from the Black Panthers. We got to get back to Du Bois and Garvey. And I'm going to show y'all something significant. When you look up the term Pan-African, you had two schools of thought, but they're going to both affirm the Pan-African concepts and ideologies. Now, one school of thought is going to say that the Pan-Africans was created by Marcus Mosiah Garvey. Another school of thought is going to say the Pan-Africans was created by Dubois. How can this, if they was bitter enemies, how are they both advocating Pan-Africanism, first of all? Uh, Second of all, if they both advocating Pan-Africanism, um, how would they be able to be on the same page in secret where they can look at odds in public? Prince Hall. And I'm going to leave that at that. And I'm going to tell you more is once again, stop negotiating treaties without your tribal chief. And if y'all know more is just trying to assert their sovereignty without their tribal chief, they need to be aware that they're negotiating treaty without the chief. And when they do that, they become a despot, which puts them as a corpus. And when they become a corpus, they become subject to the subject matter. They become the second frame in um, what they call jurisdictional right. First frame being subject matter. Second frame being subject matter of the corpus. They can never take charge of what's not dead. They can never take charge of anything that's not dead. So when you go in in a system and you fight in a system with their system, you just submit it to their system. You argue the treaty without your tribe without your clan, without your chieftain, without your representatives of your clan. If you look up joinder of the parties, you don't have to join the parties to the litigation. That's an issue between barristers. That's why it's in the court rule, but it's not in the compiled law or the uniform code. It's in the court rule, joinder of the parties. 
This is why they have to uh, issue a war rent. They have to declare war on the sovereign individual in order to drag him in and find out if he's a living man or a dead man, if he's a corpus or non-corpus. And when they do that, they issue that war rent or they declare a war on you and drug you in there. As soon as they say, are you guilty or not guilty, and you either enter a plea or let the court enter a plea of you, that's called joining the parties. As soon as they did that, you became subject to what? The subject matter. But the subject matter is a subject that's only a matter between barristers. So you got to have a barrister to represent you because you're in the, you're in the arena, the court, the domain of the barrister. Arguing as a barrister, you have no standing and you have no remedy. Why are you there? Why are you under Levi? Because you haven't found the grace. That's the way out. That's the redemption at this time. Now, I'll work with anybody that want to find their way out. I don't have no problem with it. The whole thing boils down to this. You was never a slave. You was a prisoner of war. America was set up with a commander-in-chief of the armed forces of a corporation, just like Halliburton, who set up a preliminary or interim government that was ratified in Washington, D.C., but they had to move out of the capital of the true nation because that would be in conflict and they would automatically have to uh, bow to the authority of the, of the state. So they moved to what they call the District of Columbia in order to escape the treaty right of the people because they are saying that all of the people fall under their jurisdiction because they all have an international bank that they allow the Pope to be the executor of. And the international bank account is your social security account that's dispensed through the Federal Reserve System and the U.S. Treasury. They use what they call fractional reserve banking to give you a portion of your money as a stipend. But they send you to go labor, and that portion that they would normally give you, they give it to a corporation, and the corporation give you a portion of the portion that they give you by fractional reserve labor practice calculations. So when you look into the corpus juris secundum under what a slave is, you determine a slave by the wages. You don't determine a slave by whether they get, they're working for free or not, because it's impossible. You deserve, the, the slave is determined by how much of his own product returns back to him, his own labor. Your labor returns to you in the form of currency, which is actually a die marker. So this is the mark of the beast. Because you can't buy nothing without money. So if it ain't in your hand, you're thinking about it. It's always in your head. Six, six, motherfucking six. Mark of the beast, the money, the dollar. And you got one in every country. If you don't got the money in your hand, you got it on your mind. That's why you said you're gonna either you can either buy nor sell without the mark in your hand or in your brain. So, and with that, I hope y'all learned something, and I hope I was able to contribute to y'all understanding of why we were never slaves. We was prisoners of war. We lost. We got conquered in Africa. Some of us. Some of us got conquered over here in the Amor Inca. You need to know where you at. The Amur Inca is called America now, but it's Amur Inca. The Afar Inca is called Africa now, but it's Afar Inca. But when you use the African tongue, it's the Zulu land or it's the land of the, uh, the, the, the Inca over there is called um, Aksum or Aksumi. It's indicating the people, the dark-skinned, woolly-haired people, the original people. So when you go in there talking about I know my sovereign rights. Your sovereign right is to call for your tribal chief. That's your sovereign right. Because you got to have somebody that understand that you're not in the, uh, under the subject matter of the barrister. You're not subject to the subject matter because you five fifth realize you have first claim of right to the corpus. Having first claim of right, you submit, don't submit to anybody. Because then you are God realized. You five fifth realized. It's five fifth realized there's only one judge over you, and that's the Christ herself. Queen of heaven and earth. That's it. No man can judge you at that point. Therefore, you cannot be under the laws of Levites, under the system of the levies and liens. 
Under the Code of Thieves enforced under the Uniform Commercial Code. And so with that, um, I say thank y'all for, for checking me out. And hopefully we can set the record straight and everybody can see what's before their very face. All right, so I love y'all. And until we see her, all hail the queen of heaven and earth. And I'll talk to y'all later.